Hello, all. This is John Blank, Tex, Chief Equity Strategist and Economist. I'm out to do the Tech Talk Part 2 today for you. We did Part 1 a couple weeks ago. So before I go on to this uh, journey with you today, I'm going to do some disclosures. First thing I want to tell you is that the views of John Blank, myself, the PhD, are not necessarily the views of Zach's investment research. So in short, folks, this is my view of what we're talking about today. Please hold me responsible for it, not the company. All right, so part one of this uh, was tech stocks. That was broad language that we used, and it incorporated at least five emerging areas in this current market environment. I put this chart up uh, two weeks ago for you. Innovation, genomics, fintech, robotics, and space exploration, largely similar to what we'll talk about today, which is the ARK Invest breakdowns of these areas of emerging technology. Now, within, quote, innovation, as ARK Invest lays it out, we have a confidence game. There is no doubt that there's a confidence game or two or three or how many? I don't know. But we're going to find out when you play this game of e-commerce, big data, social media, cloud community, DNA technology, stem cells, bioinformatics, therapeutics, molecular research, blockchain, 3D printing, autonomous energy, all this stuff. You can put a confidence game or two or three or four in play, no problem. What is a confidence game? It's a, when a person defrauds a victim of their money, property, or information through tricks. The perpetrator is able to defraud the victim of their possessions, aka your money, property, or information through gaining the victim's trust. So no whether you like it or not, you're trusting people's advice here on these areas of emerging technology, and that opens the door for confidence games or two, or three, or how many, I don't know. But keep this in mind as we go into today's ARK Invest discussion, I have found a few. All right, so let's set the stage again back through the Investco queues, that's the blue line. These are the top 100 NASDAQ ETF stocks, uh, 100 tech stocks. Look at that blue line, that's what you're looking for. You could have wrote this from 19, 20, and 21 very nicely. What you could have done to earn alpha is bought the ARK Innovation ETF at the bottom in March and wrote it up to the February highs 10 or 11 months later. You would have done a really brilliant job, 350% return. That attracted the money to the ARK KK Innovation ETF, which is her flagship ETF. Probably should have. Now, what happened is over the last year, 10 months, it's tanked. And it's tanked all the way back to the queues. And actually, this chart's a little old, two weeks old. She's now underperforming the Qs in 2022. So bottom line is she's not alone. The Crane shares internet China also tanked. Um, the first trust Dow Jones internet went sideways. But she really has not delivered anything for 11 months. And so why is that? Well, first of all, the, the February 21 top was when COVID vaccination ramped up and mobility vastly improved. So there was repressed sectors of economic activity that got massive ground, right? I mean, it shut the entire economy down and then it opened up and vaccinations were part of that story that were critical, global and U.S. So what did traders do? They took profits on their shutdown momentum trades and rotated into other areas. So this is very common. We see this exact insight is very critical here. It's not just the stocks you own. It's all stocks and what's going on with your stocks relative to other stocks. That's what's called a Zach's rank. You try to buy the best stocks relative to other stocks, not just relative to themselves. Obviously, that's one strategy, but also you got to know that your stocks are not in the world alone. They have other stocks. So what happened here, she was great on writing up the shutdown play. It worked brilliantly for her. Her alpha before that was non-existent, and it's gone back to being non-existent 10 months later. She had a play that worked for the shutdown. And as we'll discuss, she actually has even worse problems because the genomic revolution that she tried to call, she got wrong in part, and there are a number of confidence games, one, two, three, four, good luck with that. I'll show you what I mean. All right, so let's go to the ARK Invest Fund. I wanna do a deep dive into earnings and profitability today. This is what her website says. We invest solely in disruptive innovation. That's the front page. And further in, invest in the future today. Innovation should displace industry incumbents, increase efficiencies, and gain majority market share. 
While we believe the threat to existing businesses is grave, the long-term opportunities for companies and investors participating in this chain could be measured in the trillions. Um, in the trillions. So those are mega caps. So I will argue today that Kathy was alpha outside of the shutdown metric that played out for her favorably. Is also largely placed in Tesla and the Bitcoin plays that she put into both RKK and all her sub funds in ways to drive alpha. Uh, and you know, in many ways, uh, there's no real reason for a sort of capital putting Bitcoin in the next generation internet. I don't really see it more as I see it as a more of a financial innovation than a internet next generation innovation. But as we will learn, she's mixing and matching things and the FinTech fund and the next generation internet fund are largely the same as are the robotics fund and the spatial exploration fund, which I actually do like. It will be my number one and two picks for her ETFs, but they're also some of the smaller ones. So her bigger funds, the next generation internet and the genomics revolution feed into RKK and are causing all the problems for her. All right, so let's just go and ask the big question. How many stocks outside of existing mega caps are there defined with a potential value, quote, in the trillions? Now she found two. Let's give her credit. She found two. One was the ARK Invest catch on Tesla. How long it lasts if she's going to get out of this in time? Good luck with that. She believes in it. She wrote Tesla up. She got it right. The other was Bitcoin. I, you know, again, Argue which will as an asset class over the last year, 2021, it was the top performing asset class. She wrote it up. She bought Coinbase, she bought Grayscale, she got a lot of Bitcoin right. Let's give her credit on that. So other than that, though, she's looking for these other trillion dollar plays. And you got to ask yourself, how many trillion dollar plays are really out there? So the total U.S. market capitalization and stock market is 53.4 trillion. That includes the NYSE, the NASDAQ, and the over-the-counter markets. So 53.4 trillion. Ed Yardini on the 15th or 14th said six stocks, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, and Microsoft, which, by the way, Kathy does not explicitly own these mega caps. So these, quote, in the trillion stocks, and they really are in the trillions, have a combined market cap of 10 trillion. So basically, 20% of existing U.S. shareholder value is contained in six stocks, and Kathy Wood does not own them. And they've been around for 15, 20, 25 years. So it took 15, 20 years for these stocks to become mega caps. Uh, obviously, we know when they all were in that euphoric period, they rode down, way down, before they came way, way back up. Because basically, it took 15 to 20 years to get a mega cap. So that basically makes sense. So case, her, Kathy's one really innovation is that Tesla and Bitcoin took a lot less time to win, uh, probably a lot more less stable too. And a lot of the profits she's missing that are in the queues are in these six stocks. Now, US GDP, just to show you how incredibly inflated the entire market is, is 23 trillion. So basically, you know, we're at over two times shareholder value in the economy and 20% of that is in these six stocks, which Kathy Woods does not own. So that gets the background for you. I don't know how many more trillion dollar stocks are out there uh, when you've got six in the game already, and she called two others, uh, and this type of disproportionate scenario is playing out, um, unlikely. So let's go to the ETF overview. I like my top rank is put them in green. That's the ARC Q and the ARC X. Autonomous tech and robotics is my number one one. It's $2 billion under in management. And spatial exploration innovation is at $440 billion under management. Over the, over the last few weeks of 2022, these have actually been her top performing ARC funds. Um, share expense ratio, she keeps lower on three other funds she has, Print uh, Israel and CRTTRU, which is Print is 3D printing ETFs with 360 million. It's doing, you know, okay, you know, relative to her other funds, still down. And Israel, which is doing a little better but down. And then I don't know about the transparency ETF. This is only 20 million under management, but this is your new, like getting in on the environmental, social, and government scheme. Um, and she charges less on expense ratios for these little ones. But basically, what I want you to understand here is that the 15%, 0.2% pull down in the ARC KK is largely driven by ARC G and ARC W and ARC F flow up. So what happens here is, you know, these are latest 
you know, 15 billion under management at RKK. That goes down every time the RKK down. So don't, you know, don't take this too tightly. But this is relative. You know, so there's another five and then eight and then nine, 10, 11. So basically, 75% of RKK is in GW and F. Very little of it uh, is in Q and X. And frankly, those have been the best areas. Frankly, the areas I like better. So what are you going to learn here is that Kathy Wood's, quote, innovation ETF with this big 45 drag type thing has overweighted genomic revolution, next generation internet, and the fintech thing, which as far as I can tell, she mixes and mingles F and W so much, it's hard to see the one for the other. I actually think ARC W is a better ARC F fund than ARC F. So the point here is um, ARC KK is this giant throw of everything and the weighted average of all the stuff that's in it is going up there. And that's her, her business strategy. She says, hey, you can buy the innovation or you can buy all these basic sub revolutions that are going on. Um, that's the idea. Take a look again, 15.8% on the genomic revolution. 13 and a half on next generation and they're at 14 on the FinTech. Those roll up to the innovation and cause that downturn. So this is the story. All right, so these are the highest one year individual share returns. These are her best stocks. I'm not trying to beat up on her. We'll start out with her best stocks. Best stocks, these are the good ones. These are, I only put 25 stocks out of the 45 on one slide. And then I'll put the other 25 bottom feeders on the a slide a few free ones down. So four RKK stocks are up over the last year, four out of 45, less than 10% of the entire number of stocks. In portfolio weight terms, 15.8% of the portfolio weight is up. 11.2% is Tesla. So other than Tesla, only 4.6% of her portfolio is up. 95.4% of her portfolio is losing money over the last year. Whoo! So let's take a look at her top picks. Ginkgo Bioworks. Um, we'll get into this one, ticker DNA. Tesla, of course, you got 11% portfolio, 11.2% portfolio rate, made 20% over the last year. By the way, that's less than the S&P 500. And Telia, she's one of these CRISPR things. She's bought a lot of these CRISPR gene editing companies. There's all kinds of them in here. Beam is one if you look down the way. Um, other players, you know, CRISPR itself, she's owned, but they just lost a ton of money. I'll put it on the next slide. And then there's one company I actually like, Trimble, ticker TRMB. Not a very big weight for her, only half a percent. And this is going to be the problem here. This is an autonomous revolution technology. And actually, it is a good company and a good stock. Only earned 8% over the last year, but she had a half a percent portfolio weight on it. So Crazy way she does this. She's very levered on these genomics things that you can look into and the uh, next generation internet stuff. And it doesn't work. All right. So wiki on Ginkgo Bioworks. I'm not uh, going any further than the wiki. I'm not doing a lot of research, but just show you just how this incompetence game thing works. This company does sound interesting. And then, whoops. A DOJ investigation into fraud. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. So, is the DOJ investigation into fraud going to get us anywhere or not? Confidence game. I don't know. You don't know. The DOJ doesn't know. But you're investing in this company. And by the way, I'm not cherry picking. This is her quote best stock. All right, let's go through it. Inco Bioworks is a biotech company from the United States, founded in 2009 by scientists from MIT and headed by Tom Knight. The company specializes in using genetic engineering to produce bacteria with industrial applications. Kinko Bioworks is an analytics company that designs microorganisms for customers in a range of industries. It is self-proclaimed organism company and quote, really it was the largest, one of the world's largest privately held biotech companies. So what they were doing is using bacteria with industrial applications, which is a fascinating idea. Genetically engineered bacteria for industrial applications. So not you know, viruses, not DNA itself, but the actual bacteria. In 2019, Ginkgo was valued at 4.2 billion, raised 290 million in September and 350 in October of that year. In May of 21, it now uh, it got public through a merger in a SPAC, Special Purpose Acquisition Corporation, the big SPAC, Soaring Eagle. It gave itself a $17.5 billion valuation. On the 14th, it announced it was going to use DNA, which was the ticker for Genentech, 
which stopped using the ticker after they got acquired by Roach. They began trading this stock in September of 21. So she basically got in on that IPO a few months ago. That's what she wrote up. In late 21, an investigative report accusing Ginkgo of being, quote, a house of cards and the US DOJ inquiring regarding the alleged fraudulent activity has now taken place. So they IPO'd and then someone came out two months later and talked this thing into a house of cards, by the way, confidence game. And I don't know, you don't know, and even the DOJ does not know if this stock is gonna hold its value, but this will actually be more representative than you think. So what does this remind me of? Ah, Theranos. Just a brief timeline. Oh, wow. Elizabeth Holmes, now convicted of criminal fraud, was on top of the SARS COVID 1 virus in Singapore in 2003. Give her credit. She did have brilliance. She was on top of vaccination and the study of the early coronaviruses in Singapore in 2003, literally 18 years ago. Give her credit. It's outstanding. So let's take a look at the story. And don't look like this one fact that I'm going to point out here. Her father was a vice president of Enron. So Elizabeth Ann Holmes is an American biotech entrepreneur convicted, convicted of criminal fraud. Her father, Christian Rasmus Holmes IV, was a vice president of Enron. An energy company that later went bankrupt after an accounting fraud scandal. Confidence game. So in 2002, Holmes attended Stanford where she started chemical engineering, worked as a student researcher and lab assistant in the School of Engineering. After her freshman year, Holmes worked in a lab at the Genome Institute of Singapore and tested for severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus. Yep, coronavirus through the collection of blood samples with syringes. She filed her first patent application on a wearable drug delivery patch in 2003. In 2004, she dropped out of Stanford School of Engineering and used her tuition money as seed funding for a health tech company. Holmes founded and was CEO of Theranos, a now defunct health tech company that soared in valuation after the company. So is this another Ginkgo Bioworks or not? Who knows? But she claimed to have revolutionized blood testing. There's that word. Remember, the ARC-G is a genomics revolution, and Theranos was revolutionizing blood testing. All right, so they gave this stock in 2015. She was the youngest and wealthiest self-made billionaire in America with a $9 billion valuation on her company. In 2015, 2016, the fraud came out and she became the world's, one of the world's 19 most disappointing leaders. Um, a confidence game. Ginkgo Bioworks, no idea, folks. It's brilliant business-wide, I get Bacteria for ductal alkylation is brilliant. I just don't know about the business. So let's get to the worst 25 stocks in our KK. Oh, you know what? 14 of the top 20 worst 25 stocks are biotechs. Arc KK has a dominant mix of Arc G and Arc W. So she bought biotechs and next generation. The next generation internet place, by the way, did work for the shutdown. They do not work at all now. And she's writing down these confidence plays or these lack of awareness of how many years the commercial relevance of the ARC-G genomics revolution will take. So these are the second largest and third largest ARC funds by asset center managers and the worst performing. And she's bulked up on them. So take a look at these names, Invite, CompuGen, Editas, Iovance, Teladoc. Teladoc's, by the way, her largest holding in this stock and it does not make anything to do with genomics, nothing. So she rode Teladoc up on the whole remote working thing, worry about health, so people got a Teladoc a lot, and the stock rode up during that boom. It's tanking now, and then losing money now. CRISPR is one I, I point out in blue, Twist Biosciences, Pacific Biosciences, Fate, Nanostring, Exact Scientists, 10X Genomics, which by the way is a company, and Verisite. So if RKK had $19.5 billion in management, which it has 15 now, but let's say it had 20, which it did at one point. And then it had about 400 million HC stocks. So roughly she tried to come up with a 2.5% portfolio on average. So that's why I picked CRISPR. It is kind of like the standard portfolio weight stock. So if you're looking for how much you over and underweighted, you know, consider CRISPR to be your kind of standard weight. 
A CRISPR has a market cap of 5.2 billion. So Kathy Woods, Art KK had about 10% of CRISPR. So she gets a lot of these. She owns a lot. She's a major holder in a lot of these companies, folks. She owns a lot. Um, so this is quite fascinating and quite relevant here is that you know, Kathy Wood is uh, driving the, the, uh, the capital in these companies and maybe that is a confidence game. But well, CRISPR Therapeutics, let's read through this. First thing I want to point out here, this company had $800,000 in revenue in the third quarter. $800,000 in revenues in the third quarter. We thought it's actually it would get $4 million in the third quarter. It got $800,000. So these little companies, they just don't have any way to make money. So here's what our Zach's analyst said, reasons to sell. The company's lead candidate, the lead candidate is still a couple of years away from commercialization. So they're not making money for at least a couple of years. And the other candidates are several years away. Shares are underperforming. The industry as a result, minus 52% versus minus 22. There is a lack of marketed products as we've talked about. Failure in ongoing studies. Remember, remember, this is none of these guarantees. So they can hurt the stock. FDA, other, other researchers look into these ideas and they don't play out. Boom, done. So a couple of years away from commercialization. Overdependence on Vertex. A lot of these little genetic companies have a big partner down you know, for sales, marketing, distribution. Vertex is what is happening for CRISPR. And Vertex, they depend on Vertex. So by the way, Vertex knows more than you or Kathy Wood or anybody about CRISPR because they're their partner. So again, there's a lot of people who know how to do this. And by the way, a lot of our large cap pharma companies are playing this game. Competition, Editas, one of the things. Intellia, which by the way is the top thing and collaborates with Regeneron, Regeneron which is a giant company. Uh, and then Beam, which she also owns. So in all of these cases, Kathy would just said, hey, you know, they're all going to work. CRISPR, Editas, and Talia Beam, they're all going to work. And then you look at it again in August 2020, AbbVie's Allegan dissolved its partnership with Editas because it wasn't working. So what, is it, what does that tell you? I don't know, but genomics revolutions are not going to be like Amazon or Facebook or Google or any of these other things, they're gonna take a lot of time, years of time. So company descriptions, diverse stories of these companies, that's what I'm saying. The more vague an ETF theme, RKK is quote, innovation, the worse the story. And then another thing I'm fascinating is there's obvious ETF pairs she's playing with. Space exploration and autonomous tech, ARC X and Part Q, as I pointed out, are very similar. Uh, very hard to see what she's doing different in one for the other with the language that she's using. And ARC F and ARC W, I would be interchangeable. So let's go through ARC F and ARC W just to show what I mean here. ARC F, we took it to represent an name Square, which you know, and Coinbase, which you know. That's ARC F. So that's Bitcoin and Square. I get it. So let's look at ARC W. That's Roku, which I get. That is the next generation internet, but it's basically been around for a while. I don't know how next generation is. I just started making money. It's still at 100 times earnings. Probably going down. Roku's probably stock share price wise going down because there's so much competition there. And then Grayscale Bitcoin Investment Trust. So honestly, folks, what on earth does the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust have of next generation? Or very little as far as I'm concerned. Should have been an RCAF. Um, so why did she do this? Because she knows what I know. You stick Bitcoin stocks in portfolios during a boom for Bitcoin and they look better. That's what she did. Now, again, ARC X, which I like, you're going to see that Trimble's in there. I like Trimble, fascinating company um, in engineering and construction, you know, these mobile solutions, advanced devices creating for GPS use uh, with GPS use, great stuff, uh, lasers, optics, inertial technologies. Trimble's a great company. Print. So now she sticks her own ETF and rolls it into ARCX. So now there's yet another roll up of her own roll up, which is print goes to ARCX and ARCX goes to RK. So don't misunderstand that. She, she drives some of the assets in her management for print from ARCX, and that's how she gets print off the ground. Okay, so ARCKK top holding Teladoc, uh, and then Exact Scientists. We talked about this genomics, Exact Scientists. Another name we haven't thrown out there, but it is one of these genomics companies. Um, we can go through this all day. 
again, down at RKK, the big one for her was Tesla and Zoom. Tesla worked and she got the alpha out of it. Zoom is tanking. Again, great company. We're on Zoom right now, but as a stock, it is tanking. All right, return on assets is a real nice metric. I've done some drawing for you of our Q and arc G on the right. Arc Q, number one, which is on the top right, looks the best. And arc X, which is way at the bottom here, I didn't circle it, is my second best. They're also basically really saying, you notice that Tremble is in both, Kratos is in both, Loridium is in both, and Komatsu is in both. Um, so basically, you know, be careful here. You're buying basically the same thing with space exploration. And by the way, what does Tremble and Komatsu have to do with space exploration? I mean, they're, they're engineering firms on the ground here in the United States. The other thing to look at is she sticks a lot of, the reason I like RQ is that standard companies existing incumbents, which she says are going to disappear, are not disappearing in her fund. Uh, Deer's in there, Teradyne's in there. Uh, Kratos and Iridium and Komatsu have been in the Japanese Komatsu have been in there decades. And then again, woe and behold, uh, you know, 3D technology so it's a company. She's got a little position in there that actually just turned a corner to start working. So, but basically you can see with the ROAs in that 21, 21 column, which is all, you know, other than Iridium, pretty good place. Now look at our G. Double digit negative ROAs for most of her top holdings. I mean, just getting hammered. She has only one play vertex in her top holdings that is making money, making a lot of money on an ROA basis, but the only one. So this is the problem. She over leveraged to some ROAs that are tanking. Now, yeah, they are improving uh, some areas as these companies get up. They're still tanking and they're, 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 they're just not making money. So market cap members, uh, looking at this, this is a fascinating slide. I mean, you can stop the video here and take a look at the men's maxes of this to see how she wrote the men's up to the maxes. Um, again, here, I want to point out some things. Grayscale, Bitcoin, Top, and Coinbase. Both of those should be in ARC F and Grayscale is in ARC W. And then, you know, I, why is Tesla in next generation? And I guess you say, because it's Free, free self-driving or something, but again, you know, reaching for it. And then I, I want to point out one mistake we made here. SEE is not in ARC F, it's SE. And then I want to point out that ARC Q and ARC X, like I've told you, are similar. Turbo Kratos, Iridium, Komatsu, um, those are names in ARC Q. I personally think ARC Q makes a lot more sense, uh, but actually, you know, some of the holdings in Arc X, just because they're better stocks, are okay. So I like those two funds. Arc G, let's look at the top names here. Teladoc, which is not a genomics company. Exact Sciences, which is a genomics company to screen cancer. Pacific Biosciences, which uses the smart tech. Fate, which is using stem cells. And Ionis, which is RNA targeted drugs. So again, folks, you're calling for a genomics revolution in screening cancer, smart technology, stem cells, and RNA targeted drugs along with CRISPR, woo, that's a lot. So top is game, right? Top is game. And basically you're buying a lot of negative earnings and a lot of market momentum for excitement that probably is, as I've already shown you, years of time before commercialization. All right, so let's look at Teladoc. It's X price and consensus chart and magnitude. This is fascinating. Teladoc was around 300 at that February boom. It's around 80 now. I can get to 50, no problem. Teladoc can get to 50, no problem. Look at the negative earnings. $3 negative earnings in 2022, down to May, say, May 2 in 2023. Teladoc has lots of competition, folks. People can do Teladoc. There are three or four companies, private companies that are competing with them now. Amazon has actually come up with a Teladoc kind of play. And uh, she wrote it up. During the COVID shutdown, obviously talking to your doctor during COVID was a good thing. But by the way, look at all the negative EC, EPS spreads. I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Six of them were before the turndown. So there was plenty of news she, you could have seen and our systems at Zacks could have picked up on that would have telegraphed that big downturn in earnings revisions for 22 and 23 that you see from that February on. So like I'm saying, once that thing turned, not only did mobility improve elsewhere, but also 
the earnings of these types of companies tanked and revisions went down and people got out and the bottom is not in for Teladoc. Now look at Trimble. Trimble is what you want to see in a price in chances are in the magnitude story also is what you want to see for a proper growth stock. It's at $80 a share now. It's sold off from the 90s. You can get it back up to the 90s where it was a few weeks ago. I like Trimble on $15 upside from here, given the fair value. It does make 2 or $3 in earnings. It does have some modest growth, 10% earnings growth a year. But this is what you're looking at. This is a good stock with upside earnings revisions, lots of green arrows, uh, no downside going back for 10 or 12 quarters. Really good stock, but not a huge play, and certainly less than the S&P. So looking again at the Zach's rank, taking it out across all these six portfolios, I circled the one I liked best with the most ones and twos. Those are the strong buys and buys. And the long-term value growth and momentum stats, which are ranking, you know, we have both the Zach's rank and the BGM. So I circled just the one, take, pay attention to that. And three years for both. So again, you can see lots of ones, twos, and threes for the ARC Q, which is her smaller fund for robotics and autonomous tech. Um, it works. Now look at Teladoc, Exact Sciences, Pack B, and Fate below. These things have never worked in our system, and they have fours and fives long-term scores. They all lose money. We can't support from a basic traditional analysis the ARC G picks. We can support the ARC Qs and the ARC Xs. And that's my basic point here. So what do we do? Obviously, we're an EPS estimate revision company. So look at our KK top holdings and look at our G top holdings. Those flow through, by the way, they flow through into each other. Uh, you know, some of these funds will end up being less portfolio weights than our KK when they get there, but they flow through. So look at the EPS estimates for the last year and the current year. All negative. For ArcG, other than Vertex. Vertex is your one company that makes money. Otherwise, it doesn't make money. Not any one of them, not any of these stocks. Not only are we going to look at the top line as being negative for ArcG, but all the company constituents are other than Vertex. Roku has finally turned money, it turned around and made money. Tesla finally turned around and made money. That's her story here. She's got two of them. The rest of them are not making money. Uh, big problem. Three of five major holdings and the negatives. EPS surprises them. Again, if they're really kicking butt and they're going to get uh, EPS surprises right and left, you'll see some on RQ. You know, you get Kratos at 150, earning surprise the year at an 18% sharing surprise. Tesla did a 50%. Those are good numbers for 21. Those companies turn around. Look at RQ. Lots of negative surprises. So lots of bad news, even from analysts who know what's going on with genomics. Lots of news gets priced in that's unwelcome and unexpected. Is it a confidence game? Uh, again, folks, it might be. All right, EPS revisions. This is fascinating. I'm going to get into our last few slides here. On revisions and share price action for the S&P 500, the Invesco Qs, and our KK. So first off, let's look at the S&P 500, the, the, the little... Lines, the blue line, obviously, is the share price of the S&P 500. You can see it tanked during that shutdown that we put in gray, and then it came way up. But by and large, as you can see, the annual earnings from 2019 in orange to 2020 in green to 2022, which is light blue, and 2023, which is the top line that's red. So remember, this is looking forward. So your stock market should look forward to 2022 and 2023. And by and large, you see that the S&P is tracking between those two lines, which is exactly what you'd expect to see. Now, the Invesco Qs, when we look at that, you can see why it's holding up at the top of the 23. It's basically fully priced on next year's earnings, not this year. Um, but, you know, it's also rolled over six months ago. But again, is it going to roll over hard and fast? Um, as long as those estimate revisions don't keep cranking down, maybe not. Uh, but you can see that it's fully priced for sure. Now let's look at our KK. Now, if you did buy this at 18 or 19 and wrote it up, we did have support in terms of consensus EPS for 2019, and you might have gotten some boost into the pandemic. Um, but you can see that looking forward on the newest 
revisions, 2022 and 23, particularly 2023, maps exactly to the decline in her shareholdings. So next year's earnings and her stocks that she owns based on analyst estimates are going down and the stock is going down in advance of that. So we are actually perhaps a little bearish on it, but I personally think these estimate revisions will continue to go down for her companies and she will continue to see shareholder depreciation. So let's look through the earnings for these three areas. I got the S&P 500 showing a nice track. That's what you want as a long-term investor that it keeps going up. And then you've got the Invesco Qs, which will show you through July, you know, again, through the shutdown, the tech Qs were doing great. Now they're going sideways. And then folks, look at it, read it and weep. Don't complain to me. Um, RKK does not make money on a portfolio basis in terms of earnings. It doesn't, and it hasn't, and it's getting worse. It's getting worse from November 21 particularly. So the point here is RKK on a portfolio basis of 45 stocks does not make money. You are buying nothing for earnings. So we get into the Valuations, price earnings, growth is how growth stocks are typically valued. So we'll look at the S&P PEG for the whole 500 companies, Invesco Qs, which are just the largest 100 techs. And then we literally cannot do that for RKK because she does not make money. So we will use the price to sales ratio. The S&P price to sales ratio is around 3.2 in early 2022. As you can see here, first forward price earnings, 2.86 for the S&P, basically the same on the Invesco stock, by the way. But you can see going back to 2017 or 18 levels, these are the kind of pegs that you saw. So that is, you know, given the growth that might happen, these are not, like I said earlier, overvalued too much. Now let's look at where she is in terms of price to sales. And again, this is how we do this. So what do I get? 11 times earnings versus five. So unreal um, how Kathy Wood did this. Um, but if you want our opinion at Zach's, she can go 50% more down from here on January the 17th when I'm talking. From here, she can go down all the way in terms of real metrics to a five from 11. She can have her own stocks to get back to the valuation they used to be at. All right, so conclusion. I mean, again, folks at Zach's, we try to focus on earnings. The Q's earnings are look what you want to see over 2017, 18, 19, 20, 20, 21. They go up and your stocks go up. And that's the chart we started with. Free cash flow and return on investment for the Q's is excellent. You focus on it, you make money as an investor. The S&P 500 market kind of, you know, to toiling its time, right? Doing, you know, getting up though over five years, but just not as dramatic. And then you can see the RKK actually, like I said, from 2017 into 2020, you did have a really nice story. And from that February on, it has done nothing but get worse for you. And that's why the stocks are down, in our opinion, at Zach's. So take a pick it, look at this and say, what ETF would you rather own? The Qs, the S&P 500, or the RKK? You know my answer is going to be the Qs um, because I work at Zach's and I think like an economist. So that's where we're going to end this at. I'm going to thank you all for attending my part two. I will have a part three on other ETF in the emerging tech space. We will go through other ETFs that are better constructed than these ones. And hopefully you'll learn why I think there's better ways to pick away the themes and think about things by using existing stocks that are making more money than these ones that Kathy Wood has. So I thank you for joining us today. Please subscribe to our services and call us and, 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 and talk to us. 866-794-6065 is our phone number. And strategy call at zaxpro.com is the email and we have a website www.zaxpro.com also people we have a linkedin zax professional services on that and we have a twitter feed but by and large please uh subscribe to our services that's what these videos are all about there's a ton of information that we are using and applying here in these videos and that is going to drive more results for you as a customer 
I can show you today just how much you learned about ARK Invest funds that you didn't know from our services. So again, pay attention to using our services as a tool for extracting these insights. Um, that is the way forward for a lot of all of us is to get better information out there. That's why I'm doing these videos and I will continue to do these videos to improve your understanding of true information that you can make money at. So go ahead, like I said, I'm gonna sound like a beaten, beaten and being a horse, but it's really important. Subscribe to our services. That's how we, we keep these videos going.